Hi, I'm Julia Lupton, and I teach and study Shakespeare here at UCI. So what did virtue mean to Shakespeare? And how is the intellectual virtue of humility required for success at the university? And is humility something that's developed when we study literature and perform drama? Let's start with what virtue meant to Shakespeare. He uses the word almost 700 times, but he uses it to mean lots of different things, from the pharmaceutical powers of plants and minerals, which is very, very broad, to female chastity and virginity, which is actually kind of narrow. In the ancient world, virtue is associated with power, potentiality, and capacity as such. Hence the idea that plants, or organs, or even your feet have virtues. But this potentiality in the natural world had to be developed through human skills and practices. The Greek word arete means excellence, and it has the sense of a potential that is refined and perfected through practices, such as medicine, or music, or statescraft, or household management. There's a strong intellectual component here, right? because medicine, music, politics, and economy are all academic disciplines that we still study at universities today. And then finally, there is a sense of specifically moral excellence, the main sense that virtue carries today. The cardinal virtues of courage, justice, temperance, and wisdom combine reason with emotion. They are intellectual, but they also involve our passions and commitments. The moral virtues are developed through practice and in skilled activity, but we use them in every setting of social life, not just when we are practicing medicine or playing music. So what's intellectual humility? This is Socrates, and he was famous for saying that he knew one thing, namely that he knew nothing, and he felt that that insight is the beginning of all wisdom. I like this drawing from the 15th century. Truth, purity, humility, and poverty are having a conversation. And look who's talking. It's truth. And look who's listening. It's humility. The artist is telling us that in order to get to the truth, we need to learn how to listen. We need to put aside our presuppositions and hear other points of view. Intellectual humility is really a form of moderate skepticism that makes us wary of all dogmatic opinions and open to reason or truth. Notice that humility is often expressed physically by bowing one's body or bending one's head. Notice here how humility's head and arms express her capacity to listen and hear. That's because humility is outwards facing. It concerns how we respond to other people and their ideas. Take a second and think about how you communicate your attention when you're talking to other people. Are you making eye contact and listening intently? Yes, animals can listen and be humble too. Look at this beautiful family of apes. Or are you checking your phone? There's even a word for this now, it's called fubbing. So how can humility play a part in theater and the performing arts? We think of actors and rock stars as people with big egos fed by Instagram likes. But one of the things that I've learned from hanging out in rehearsal rooms is how much humility is required in theater. Most actors spend more time on stage listening to what the other characters are saying than they do speaking their own lines. They have to stay totally immersed and tuned into the action on the stage. Otherwise, they will fail miserably when it's their time to talk. And they are acting even when they aren't talking because they're responding with their faces and bodies to whatever is happening on stage. Good actors have to learn how to listen, and we do too. Intellectual humility is not just a Western idea. According to Buddhists, humility liberates you from false perceptions about the world. It allows you to be more genuine with other people. In fact, there's a wonderful Buddhist story called A Cup of Tea. 
Nan In, a Japanese master, received a university professor, someone like me, who came to inquire about Zen. Nan In served tea. He poured his visitor's cup full, and then he kept on pouring and pouring. The professor watched the overflow until he no longer could restrain himself. He said, it's over full. No more will go in it. Like this cup, Nanin said, you are full of your own opinions and speculations. How can I show you Zen unless you first empty your cup? So you have to have a humble, empty mind to begin to grasp this Buddhist concept of emptiness. Only by voiding yourself of false perceptions can you take steps towards wisdom. In Buddhism, as with Socrates, there is a close correlation between knowledge and virtue. I love this picture from ancient Egypt. A scribe is kneeling at the throne of Thoth, the god of writing. And look at how his pose is not simply that of a professional concerned with completing a task, but also expresses his humility in the presence of writing as a practice of knowledge. Every time we sit down to read or write something, we should consider the power of the tools we are using. They have the power to inform or deceive, to communicate or to intimidate, to educate or to confuse. That's enough to make me humble. Or at least put away my phone. If these guys can listen and be humble, so can I. How about you? Thank you.